Hello everyone, and welcome to the Russian Empire History Podcast, the history of all the peoples of the Russian Empire. I'm your host, J.P. Bristow. This is Season 1, The Forest, The Steppe, and the Birth of the Russian Empire. Episode 11, Sarmatians and Saka. My apologies for the late release of this episode. I had quite a bad cold and did not have the voice to record it on time. Last time, I said that this episode would be Sarmatians, Saka, and the legacy of the Scythians. But that turned out to be rather a lot of material, so I decided to split it in two. This episode will look at the Sarmatians and Eastern Scythians, and the next episode will cover the Scythian legacy. Sarmatians and Saka generally fall under the umbrella of Scythians, due to the shared elements of their culture. And in the Western Steppe, the Sarmatian takeover did not involve huge changes. So I'm going to take a quick run-through, summarising the chronology of the Sarmatian period, and then look at how they were different to the Scythians. Finally, I will just take a quick look at the Saka, as although related to the Scythians, they did not migrate into the East European plain, and therefore are not really part of our story in Season 1. In the 9th century BCE, the Chimerians moved west into the southern Russian steppe. 200 years later, the Scythians followed them, and 200 years after that, the Sarmatians arrived. Two names have come up over the last few episodes, Sauromatai and Sarmatians, and although it is not 100% clear, it seems that they were probably the same people. One theory is that the Sauromatai were already established on the Volga, where Herodotus describes them as not Scythian but related to the Scythians, and then in the 5th century a new group of migrants appeared from the east, emerging from the Massagetai, who had driven the Scythians west. And they arrived in the Don Volga plain, assimilated with the Sauromatai, and gave them their already similar name, Sarmatians. The Sarmatians moved over the Don to attack the royal Scythians, and according to Diodorus, turned the greater part of the country into a desert. The Scythians were pushed west, where they were eventually submerged by Macedonians and Celts, and south, where their long-standing relationship with the Bosporan kingdom gradually transitioned into full symbiosis, leaving the Sarmatians as overlords of the Western Steppe. So, as I said a minute ago, to a large degree this did not mean that much had changed. The Sarmatians shared the Scythian triad and the material culture of the Scythians and had the same socio-political structure, focused on acquiring wealth to maintain the comitatus. As with the Scythians, there were a number of peoples under the Sarmatian umbrella. Most prominently, the Aorsi, who had become known as the Alans, the Syracis, who we saw involved in the Bosporan Kingdom's War of Succession back in Episode 5, the Roxolani, which means something like Shining Alans, and the Iazigis, who ended up settling at the western limits of the region we are concerned with. Several steppe peoples had names based on the colours of their horses, so the Roxolani may have preferred pale horses, in contrast to the Scythians, who liked reddish colours and traded other colours away. The Sarmatians enter the historical records with greater frequency from around the late 2nd century into the 1st century BCE, when they start raiding everyone around them. Parthians, Medians and Armenians in Asia Minor, and the Roman provinces of Pannonia and Moesia on the Danube, where an attempt to cross the river was beaten off in 16 BCE. As with the Scythians previously, 
they spent as much time as mercenaries as they did raiding for themselves. In the 30s CE, Sarmatians fought for Pharasmanes in the Parthian civil war. In 49 CE, the Syracis and Aorsi fought on either side of the Bosporan succession war. Then the Iazigis supplied Quadi, a Roman Germanic client king, with cavalry in a war against his rivals. In 69 CE, the Roxolani made an attempt on Moesia, but got caught in the mud of the spring thaw and mown down by the Romans without being able to use their horses. More successfully, in 73 CE, the Alans overran Media and defeated the Armenian king Tiridates. The Iazigis played a major role in the Dacian Wars with Trajan that resulted in the creation of the Roman province of Dacia, roughly where modern-day Romania and Moldova are located. In 135 CE, the Alans raided Media and Armenia, where they were successfully dealt with by the Roman governor, a man named Arian, who wrote an essay on how to fight the Alans that has survived, and a book of tactics for fighting steppe warriors that has not. Three decades later, the Iazigis joined up with the Germans again for the Marcomannic Wars, becoming the first invaders to penetrate into Italy for almost 300 years, before they were eventually defeated by Marcus Aurelius, and the Iazigis made peace with Rome. As part of the peace settlement, they handed over 8,000 hostages, over 5,000 of whom Marcus Aurelius sent to Britain. They will come up in the next episode. The Sarmatians maintain their control of the western steppe until the next wave of migration, which ran into the larger migration period around the collapse of the Western Roman Empire. Gothic forces overran the Sarmatians in the North Caspian in the late 300s, bringing the Scythian Age to a close. We will not be talking about the Goths much. They were just passing through and don't have much to do with our story. The Vandals, on the other hand, had a bit more of a role. The Alans formed an alliance with the Vandals that was quite significant, and we will talk about that a bit more in the next episode when we look at the legacy of the Scythians. The remaining Sarmatians joined some people we will be talking about in upcoming episodes on the Turkic peoples, Attila the Hun and his steppe confederation. And with that, with one exception we will come back to, the Western Scythians were absorbed by their successors. So, The Sarmatians galloped out of the steppe, spent a few hundred years raiding, trading, and hiring out as mercenaries. So far, so much like the Scythians. Let's take a look at what made the Sarmatians different. There are fewer surviving images of Sarmatians than Scythians. Works from the Bosporan kingdom show them with long hair and moustaches or beards. But Lucian wrote that they wore their hair much shorter than the Scythians. Alans are depicted with ponytails, and Ammianus wrote that they were of great stature and beauty. Their hair is somewhat yellow, their eyes are frighteningly fierce. The Alans were also into cranial deformation. This was something that the Huns would be famous for later. They would bandage the heads of infants, so that as their soft skull bones hardened, they would gradually set into an elongated shape. These skulls are occasionally found among remains from the early Sarmatian period, and the practice became more prevalent over time. With up to 70% of the skulls found in 3rd to 4th century Alan sites on the Lower Volga being deformed. Unlike the Scythians, Saka, and really most steppe dwellers, Sarmatians are almost always depicted bareheaded. This is a bit strange, and no one seems to have come up with a valid explanation. They certainly wore hats. You are not going anywhere in the steppe winter without one. 
and the summer sun on the lower Volga is strong enough to make you want some protection too. Distinctive headgear is usually one of the easiest ways to distinguish steppe peoples, the conical Scythian cap being the obvious example. But the most important difference between the Scythians and the Sarmatians was military. We have already seen how the Scythians gave birth to the mounted archer of the steppe, and now the Sarmatians would develop the heavy lancer. They would revolutionise warfare, not just on the steppe, and shape armies from Central Asia to the Atlantic for centuries. In the early Sarmatian period, it appears that every man would bear arms and serve as a warrior whenever necessary, much as had been the case with the Scythians. As the Sarmatians became the dominant force on the western steppe, the archaeological evidence suggests that a warrior caste began to appear, with tribal leaders becoming a kind of aristocracy. The blood oaths we discussed previously were also used here. The warriors would swear to their leader, the leaders would swear to the tribal chief, and the tribal chiefs would swear to the king. Lucian describes how a Sarmatian leader would recruit an army for a mission of vengeance. Quote, when a man who has been wronged wishes to avenge himself, but is not strong enough by himself, he sacrifices a bull, cuts up and cooks the meat, spreads the hide on the ground, and sits on it with his hands behind his back as if tied. The meat of the bull is served up, and the man's kinsman and anyone else who wishes to join takes a portion, places his right foot on the hide, and swears an oath according to his ability. One to supply five horsemen, another ten, another foot soldiers, heavy armed or light armed, as the case may be, or simply himself if he is poor. In this way, a very large force can sometimes be raised on the hide, and such an army is highly dependable and hard for the enemy to conquer. End quote. The Romans frequently referred to the Sarmatians as disorderly rabble, who were only out to pillage and plunder. But descriptions of actual battles show that as the lancer became the key warrior, professionalism and discipline increased. We do not know when and where the armoured lancer first appeared. For sure it was somewhere in the great steppe expanse from northeastern Iran into Central Asia. There is evidence of heavy cavalry in the region going back to the 5th century, and they would definitely have first appeared quite some time before the first reliable reports of successful heavy cavalry armies, which date to the 2nd century BCE. The Greeks called these heavy cavalry cataphracts, meaning covered with armour. Recall that the Scythians, it was generally agreed, did not wear any armour. No one knows what the Sarmatians called lancers themselves, but there was another Greek word, contaphorus, contus bearer, contus being a particularly long kind of lance, that could be equally applicable. If you recall, the various terms for Scythian derived from the term archer, so it is possible that the Sarmatians could have called themselves the lancers. There is one theory that the long lances were adopted in response to Alexander the Great's phalanxes with their sarissas, but they were not long enough to get past those. In any case, the first archaeological remains for Sarmatian armoured lancers come from the 3rd century BCE on the Volga, and the first written reference might be that description of the battle between the Bosporan brothers by Diodorus that we covered back in episode 5. If you recall, Ariphanes and Eumelus both drew up their armies with the cavalry in the centre of the line, and Eumelus' charge swept Ariphanes' line away. That sounds more like a heavy charge than archers.
although Diodorus does not specify. The heavy lancer most likely took a while to spread throughout all the Sarmatian peoples. Greek geographer Strabo says that the Roxolani wore rawhide helmets and corslets, carried wicker shields, and used bow, sword, and long chass, a type of spear much shorter than a contus lance. But by the first century, the lancers were definitely on the scene. Roman historian Tacitus describes the campaign in which Pharasmanes, king of Iberia, hired Sarmatian mercenaries to fight the Parthians who had invaded his brother Mithridates' kingdom of Armenia. The Parthian mounted archers entered the battle expecting to carry out their normal manoeuvres, breaking the Iberian ranks with false retreats and raining arrows down on them. But they were taken by surprise when instead of standing off in similar counter manoeuvres, the contus bearing Sarmatians charged them, pinning the archers down and allowing Pharasmane's infantry to quickly close in on the vulnerable archers for the kill. Tacitus next mentions the raid into Moesia, where the Sarmatians got stuck in the spring thaw. The slippery, snowy mud denied the horses purchase, and armoured riders who fell into the mud found it difficult to get up. As we previously mentioned in the Steppe Warriors episodes, their swords had gradually been getting longer as well. And Tacitus mentions them having trouble wielding the swords on foot compared to chopping down into foot soldiers from the saddle. But Tacitus admits that this battle was out of the ordinary and the Romans had got lucky. Usually, he writes, quote, when they charge in squadrons, hardly any battle line can stand against them. End quote. After Tacitus, Roman writers begin describing the Sarmatians as carrying lances of unusual length and equipping their horses with armour as well. These heavy lances are described as irresistible in a head-on charge, but also as somewhat lumbering and difficult to manoeuvre. However, the evidence is contradictory, as other writers continue to describe them as lightly armoured, making it difficult to tell how widespread the heavy lances were or how they were actually equipped. As we mentioned in our chronological overview, in 135 CE, the Alans raided Parthian territory and then came up against the Romans, led by the governor of Cappadocia, Arian, who defeated them and wrote the battle order against the Alans to describe his successful tactics. His text shows that he expected a frontal charge by lancers and responded by arming his legionaries with even longer spears and ensuring they would not break to follow any feigned retreat. In 173 CE, the Romans managed to force Aeaziges' raid to engage with them on the frozen Danube, counting on the ice to reduce the effectiveness of the horses. The Iaziges launched a frontal charge and sent a group around to add an attack from the rear, but the Romans successfully withstood them. Cassius Dio writes that the Sarmatians who fell from their horses were easily dispatched because their light armour did not provide sufficient protection. So, were the Sarmatians heavily armoured at this time or not? There are a couple of theories. The first is that they were indeed heavily armoured to begin with, but as the Huns began to trickle into the western steppe, bringing the more powerful Hunnic bow with them, the benefit of the heavy armour was negated by the greater penetration power. Why weigh yourself down with heavy armour that prevents you manoeuvring if it is not going to stop an arrow? The Huns themselves mostly did not bother with armour. The second, more probable theory, is that only the elite were able to equip themselves with full armour, while the bulk of the army continued to rely on speed and manoeuvrability.
by a couple of centuries later, as the Romans themselves transitioned to a largely cavalry army, it was the speed and force of the Allen and Hun attacks, rather than the sheer weight, that they admired and set up for emulation. So, if the Sarmatians were not the antique equivalent of medieval knights in full plate armour, what did they wear? Romans saw them as similar to the Parthians, but this was due to their common origins on the steppe, rather than to a direct Parthian influence on the Sarmatians. It is also worth noting that while the Parthian heavy cavalry was always referred to as cataphracto, that is, as being heavily armoured, the Sarmatians were more frequently called contaforo, or contarius in Latin, which indicates that their lances made more of an impression than their armour. Strabo and others refer to Sarmatians as wearing hardened leather armour, which would presumably have been easy to procure for a cattle herding people but it seems from archaeological finds and images that their most popular protection was scale armour. Scale armour is made by attaching small pieces of armour to a backing material. It is easier to make than chain mail, which was invented by the Celts and also gradually increased in popularity on the steppe, or single-piece cuirasses and provided better protection against arrows than mail. The Sarmatian scale armour that has been found is usually iron. Bronze is quite rare, with rectangular scales ranging from about 1.5 times 2 cm to 8 times 2 cm. That's about two-thirds of an inch by just under an inch, and just under an inch by 3 inches. Holes were drilled at the top, and they were attached to a leather or linen backing with copper wire or leather ties, laid out in an overlapping pattern like roof tiles. Where iron was scarce or too expensive, scale armour was also made out of horse hooves. As mentioned when we were talking about bows, horn can be steamed and split to form plates. Pausanias, a Greek travel writer, described the horn scale armour as looking like a pine cone, and Ammianus also describes the Sarmatians who raided Pannonia and Moesia in the 4th century as wearing cuirasses of smooth polished horn fastened to linen shirts. A guy named Edward Cheshire wrote his PhD thesis on non-metallic armour prior to the First World War and looked into how effective these different materials were. Comparing materials by penetration depth times density to measure their resistance to piercing, with the lower the number, the better the material. Leather had an index of 4.36, while horn had an index of 0.3. So it was very effective, and Pausanias commented that it held up to arrows at short range as well as metal armour. Unfortunately, Horn sewn to linen tends to decompose, and so no scale armour of this type has ever been found. I've mentioned shields a few times. Only a couple of Sarmatian shields have ever been found, although Roman writers refer to them carrying them. This is because they were also made of perishable materials. Like the Persians, they carried wicker shields with a leather face. I don't know about you, but wicker shields do not sound particularly protective to me. However, despite my searches, I was unable to find any studies of their effectiveness, and we can only assume that they did the job, as they remained in use for several centuries. As already noted, the Sarmatian lance was called the contus, which meant a particularly long lance. Depictions in Bosporan wall paintings show lances around 4.5 metres long, or almost 15 feet. They were not tucked under an arm, like knights jousting, but used two-handed, with the right hand close to the hip, and the left hand directing the strike. Stirrups were still not in common use at this time, and a high-speed charge with a lance 
would naturally have required a firm seat. Bosporan images and statues show that the Sarmatians used saddles with a rear support and horns that partially enclosed the rider's thighs, enabling them to effectively brace for the impact. The effectiveness of this type of saddle has been investigated, and it was found that while stirrups made mounting and dismounting easier, as well as greatly contributing to comfort on long-distance rides, the horn saddle was just as effective for stabilising a charging lancer. If the lance broke, the Sarmatian warrior could turn to his sword. While the Scythians had carried the short akinakes for close engagements, swords grew longer over time, and the Sarmatian sword was around 100 centimetres long, and ideal for cutting downwards from the saddle. As the sword grew longer, warriors came to pair it with a dagger, with one blade carried on each hip. And we should not forget about the bow either. Despite the emphasis on lances and swords, the Sarmatians were as competent archers as any other steppe people. After the first century, they moved more to use of what is usually called the Hunnic bow, although it does not seem to have actually originated with the Huns. It was bigger than a Scythian bow, and used bone ears for a considerable increase in power. Sarmatians also moved to using predominantly iron arrowheads, while the Scythians had commonly used stone and bone. This bow was too large for the Scythian garitos, which fell out of use, and was carried in its own bow case, with the arrows held in a cylindrical quiver. The Sarmatians had a couple of interesting differences in horse care compared to the Scythians. While the Scythians let the horse's mane and tail flow freely, the Sarmatians tied the tail into a braided sleeve and knotted the mane into a style called crenellation, forming it into a variety of shapes that looked a bit like the top of a castle wall. No one knows what significance the different styles may have had, but the Mongols later used tail knots to indicate a horse's age and training so it might have been something similar. They also had a unique brand called a tamga, which was like an early heraldic sign, and was also used to mark personal possessions and equipment. The Sarmatians carried a characteristic standard, the draco, a windsock like a dragon on a tall pole, that the Romans, who later adopted it for their own cavalry, said that the Sarmatians had invented. Arian said that it was made by sewing dyed material together, hanging limp when the rider was at rest, and flying like a serpent and whistling in the wind at the gallop. It was most likely first used to give archers an indication of the wind direction. Although the Roman standards came to be embellished with more classical European dragon designs, the Sarmatian dracos were in a more eastern style. Hello everybody, this is Trevor Cully, host of the History of Persia podcast. From about 550 to 330 BC, most of the Middle East was ruled by the Achaemenid Persians. The Achaemenids pioneered the concept of a truly multinational empire that incorporated people from as far away as India and Greece under the banner of one empire for over 200 years. The story of Persia discusses the fall of ancient civilizations, the origins of endurance racing, 300 Spartans, the March of the Ten Thousand, and at least one evil priest who replaced and impersonated the king, all before the Achaemenids came to a dramatic close with the story of being on the losing end of Alexander the Great's conquests. If that story and the cultures that surround it sound interesting to you, check out the History of Persia at historyofpersiapodcast.wordpress.com or wherever you find your favorite podcasts, like this one. There is one other important aspect to Sarmatian warriors that is always raised whenever they come up for discussion. The Amazons. Although among the Scythians, warriors seem to have been exclusively male, Herodotus and other writers note that among the Sarmatians, the women would also fight. <laughs> 
According to Herodotus, after their war with the Greeks, the Amazons ended up on the coast of the Azov, from whence they took to raiding the Scythian lands and eventually joined with the Sarmatians. If you look up the Sarmatians, nine times out of ten, one of the first things you will see is that their female warriors are the source of the Amazon myth. This is one of those popular misconceptions that is not actually true. First, just to be clear, although we may use Amazon to refer to any warrior woman, and there are various myths and legends about female warriors from around the world, they were actually a specific people in Greek myth, who lived in a society without men, indeed opposed to men, an antithesis of the male-dominated Greek society and not in any way a purported steppe society where men and women were equals. They were based in Anatolia, and existed in Greek tales before the Scythians moved on to the western steppe. The Amazons are never depicted as steppe-style horse archers, but as Greek hoplite infantry, in armour, crested helmets, with round shields and spears. Indeed, When linking the Amazons to the Sarmatians, Herodotus makes sure to include a story of them travelling from Anatolia to the northern Black Sea coast. It is true that the Greeks appear to have linked supposed female warriors on the steppe to their existing Amazon myth, but they later did the same for the Persians. So, if the Sarmatians were not the source of the Amazon myth, Did they actually have warrior maidens who, as Herodotus says, were not permitted to marry until they had killed a man? Most of the literature on this subject basically seems to fall into two camps. The first says that the Sarmatian graves that have been identified by archaeologists as women and contained weapons show that they were warriors, that any suggestion to the contrary is mere sexism and that the steppe was an egalitarian world where the use of ranged weapons on horseback meant that women cancelled out any male strength advantage. The second camp says that there are no actual reports of women fighting battles, just comments that Sarmatian women were allowed to fight. The identification of remains in graves as female is problematic, and anyway, women are weak, and clearly could never compete with male warriors, whether with bows or anything else. I have to say that I found most of the discussions in the books and papers I read on this quite unsatisfactory. Citing studies by the US Marines saying that women can't carry as much gear as far and fast as men tells you nothing about horse archers. An assertion that men are stronger and would therefore be more effective archers may be reasonable, but unless you have some evidence, I can't just accept it. Meaningful fighting did not take place at the limits of an archer's range, but well within the envelope of accurate fire, by either male or female. The contrary claim, that it's sexist to say women can't be warriors, is likewise entirely reasonable, but it's not evidence that they actually were warriors. But it seems to me that we are not forced to rely on 2,000-year-old descriptions noted down by a Greek historian based on second-hand travellers' tales, or on assumptions based on an arrowhead found in a grave. There are still people out there keeping steppe archery alive, and we can probably get some insight from them. Traditional horse archery is a competitive sport across the steppe, from Iran to Mongolia. Competitors take part in traditional steppe clothing, completing a variety of target shooting tasks on horseback. I wrote to Anna Minkinen, a traditional horse archer from Finland, whose highly entertaining videos on YouTube show her riding at full pelt through northern forests and Central Asian steppe, hitting targets in all directions as she goes, and asked her for her thoughts. She confirmed that there are no gender divisions in the sport. Women compete with men on an equal footing and often win.
so Anna saw no reason why women would not have been equally competent hunters on the steppe, and even if they did not ride with the armies, they would surely have been capable of defending themselves and their families. This bore out my assumption that the lethal range for archery was inside a woman's effective range, and if brute force is taken out of the equation, then it would come down to skill. So women could be equally competent mounted archers, and at the least we can assume that they would have been capable of hunting and taking part in defence of their families and tribes. But is there any evidence that they actually did? The most commonly cited evidence for female warriors comes from grave finds. It is true that there have been numerous finds of what appear to be female graves containing weapons, but it is not quite that clear cut. With adults, the differences between male and female skulls and pelvic bones are sufficient to allow highly reliable sex determination. However, the same is not true if the deceased had not reached puberty. That accounts for around 30% of graves that have been identified as female. They were identified as female because of the presence of other items associated with women. But this is not always reliable. Many Sarmatian warrior graves, for instance, contain tools for spinning, an activity that archaeologists associate with women. The next problem is quantity. Many of the graves identified as warrior women contained a single arrowhead and no other weapons. Does that mean they weren't warriors? Not necessarily, but there could have been another ritual reason to place a single arrowhead in the grave. Thirdly, there is the question of physiological evidence. Any long-term habitual physical activity leaves traces in the muscles and skeleton. By studying remains, we can tell that the women in one place spent a large amount of their time squatting, maybe grinding flour or sorting other foodstuffs. The remains of sailors from the age of sail show that they had physiques like modern gymnasts, with heavily muscled shoulders and arms and less developed legs due to the amount of time spent climbing the rigging. The bodies of archers and swordsmen show muscular asymmetry, as the load is not evenly distributed. We would expect to see the same in female warriors, but it seems that these studies have not systematically been carried out. There is also the question of wounds. A number of studies assert that the remains identified as female warriors show signs of battle wounds. However, not all scholars agree. Some assert that none of these remains show arrow wounds, which is not in itself conclusive, although arrow wounds might be expected to be the most common type of wound. An arrow through soft tissue would not leave a trace in skeletal remains. There are also very few injuries consistent with a bladed axe or sword attack, and some scholars argue that the broken bone injuries that are present could equally well have been caused by a fall as by defending against a weapon. Finally, although from the time of Herodotus until the last couple of decades, a contrast was drawn between the supposedly egalitarian practices of the Sarmatians and the traditionally patriarchal Scythians, the current state of excavations is that a higher proportion of Scythian female graves contain weapons than Sarmatian. Around 25% of Scythian graves compared to 20% of Sarmatian. Despite this, contemporary reports all agree that Scythian women were not warriors, and none of the many Bosporan depictions of Scythian warriors shows any warrior maidens. And just to illustrate that our intuitions may not always line up with the practices of other societies in history, where a child is buried with an adult in a Sarmatian grave, in every single case discovered to date, the child has been buried with a male adult. So, rather than Amazons, or an egalitarian society with armies of male and female warriors fighting side by side, 
it is more likely that the role of Sarmatian women was more in the area of hunting and defence, which would still have made them very different and noteworthy to Greek and Roman cultures, if not quite egalitarian to our modern understanding. So let us turn to the Saka. The corridor of steppe running between Central Asia and the Caspian steppe was narrower 2,000 years ago, as the Caspian Sea was fuller. The people living to the east of the corridor, the area that is now the Kazakhstan steppe, sometimes known as Eastern Scythians or Asian Scythians, are now commonly called Saka to distinguish them from the peoples of the Western steppe. Greek writers gave them a number of names, Agrippians, Acidonians, Massagetae, and say some of them were Scythians and some of them weren't. The Persians called them all Saka, using the name for both Eastern and Western Scythians. They distinguished the Saka Homavaga and the Saka Tigrahauda. Homavaga means eaters of Homa or Soma, the ephedra derived drug that was consumed by a number of Iranic peoples and had religious significance in Zoroastrianism, the religion of Persia. Tigrahauda means pointy hat wearers, a reference to the common Scythian headgear. Some historians identified the Tigrahauda with the Masageto. The Saka traded with the Persians like their western cousins traded with the Greeks. The gold in Peter the Great's Siberian collection features many Achaemenid pieces and items in a Persian style. The Persians conquered the southern reaches of Saka territory turning them into vassal peoples. The Behistun inscription is a rock relief on a cliff in western Iran, created by Darius the Great to commemorate his victories. Referring to the Saka, the inscription reads, quote, I journeyed with an army to Sakam, beyond the Saka to Grahalda. These Saka went from me. When I arrived at the river, I crossed it with all my army. Afterwards, I smote the Saka exceedingly. I took a leader captive. This one was led bound to me and I slew him. The chief of them, by name Skunka, they seized and led to me. Then I made another their chief, as was my desire. After that, the land became mine. End quote. The relief shows a train of defeated kings lined up before Darius, with Skunka in characteristic Scythian clothes and pointed hat bringing up the rear with his hands tied behind his back and a rope around his neck. But this was not the only Persian expedition against the Saka. Herodotus also tells the tale of Cyrus the Great's attempt to subdue the Saka after he had conquered Babylon. According to Herodotus, the Massageti were living in a vast plain, stretching from the river Oxus. They were ruled by a queen named Tomiris or Tomiris who had taken the throne following the death of her husband. Cyrus sent ambassadors with proposals of marriage, but Tomiris understood that he wanted the kingdom, not her, and refused them permission to approach. Thwarted, Cyrus assembled his armies to attack the Massagetae, camping on the river while they built a bridge. Tomiris sent a herald to him, quote, King of the Medes, Cease this enterprise. You will win no advantage here. Be content to rule your own kingdom in peace and allow us to reign over the countries that are ours. However, I know you will not listen to my counsel as you wish for nothing less than peace and quietness. So come now. If you want to test the Massagetae in arms, leave your useless bridge-making. Let us retire three days' march from the river, then come across with your soldiers or we can come to give battle on your side. End quote. Cyrus consulted with his advisers, and all were in favour of letting the Massagetae cross the river to fight on Persian ground. The only objector was Croesus the Lydian. Advising the king to remember that he is a man and not an immortal, and should therefore heed counsel when warned of danger, he said, quote, if you agree to allow the enemy into your country, consider the risk. Lose the battle, and you will lose the whole kingdom. 
If the Massagetae win, they will not return home. They will push to take your empire. If you win, you win far less than you would if you crossed the river, where you can follow up your victory. Rout their army on the other side of the river, and you can push straight into the heart of their country. Moreover, is it not disgraceful for Cyrus, the son of Cambyses, to fall back and yield ground to a woman? End quote. The cunning Croesus then recommended the old trick of preparing a feast for the steppe warriors, concealing their withdrawal with a screen of expendable men, and then falling on the drunk and overfed Saka. The upshot was that Cyrus changed his mind. Telling Tomyris he was on his way, he crossed the river and marched inland for a day. Then he set up camp and withdrew his good troops. Sure enough, not long after, a detachment of Massagetae, around a third of their army, led by Tomyris' son, Spargopises, put the expendables to the sword and began feasting. The Persians returned, slaughtered most of them and captured the rest, including Spargopises. Enraged, Tomyris sent another herald to Cyrus. Quote, Bloodthirsty Cyrus, Take no pride in this unworthy success. The grape juice that makes you mad was the poison that ensnared my child and let you overcome him without a fair, open fight. Listen now to my advice and be sure it is for your own good. Restore my son to me and leave unharmed with your triumph over a third of the Massagetae. Refuse, and I swear by the sun that however bloodthirsty you are, I will give you your fill of blood. End quote. Cyrus ignored the message. Meanwhile, when Spargopises sobered up and saw how he had screwed up, he asked to be released from his bonds. As soon as he was free, he killed himself. The final battle was now inevitable, and Herodotus writes that it was the fiercest combat the barbarians had ever engaged in. The archers loosed their arrows until their quivers were empty. Then they charged with their lances. With their lances broken, they fought on with daggers. Neither side yielded any ground, but the Massagetae prevailed. Most of the Persians were destroyed, and Cyrus himself was killed. Tomyris filled a skin with human blood, decapitated Cyrus' corpse, and dipped the head in the blood, saying, You took my son by deceit, but I make good my threat and give you your fill of blood. To round off the story, Herodotus comments, that of the many different accounts which are given of the death of Cyrus, this one is most worthy of credit. Well, Herodotus always liked a good story, but unfortunately we don't know whether this one is true. Although the circumstances of Cyrus' death are unclear, there are other plausible scenarios, and no conclusive evidence in its favour. If you would like to know more about Cyrus, his life, and theories about his death, I recommend listening to Trevor Cully's History of Persia podcast. Like their western cousins, the Saka would gradually settle, assimilate with neighbouring sedentary peoples, or be swept away by successive waves of migration. But the treasures of the Kurgans are not all they left behind. Join me next time for our last episode on the ancient Indo-Iranian steppe peoples and the legacy of the Scythians. Don't forget to check the accompanying blog post for maps and images. You'll find a link in the show notes. You can contact me through the Russian Empire History Podcast website, Facebook or Twitter, or by email at hello at the Russian Empire History Podcast dot com. Thank you for listening, and I hope you will join me next time. <laughs>